is going on, everyone? The Phillies split with the Los Angeles Dodgers. It could be worse. Eh, it could be better, but it could be worse. There were some beatdowns involved in this series. A walk-off win. A come-from-behind win late. I think that there's value in this series. I think that there's something that the Phillies can actually hold on to as positives and move forward. Let's hope. Am I just being a fan? Am I just being a fan using blind optimism? I don't think so. I think that there's actually things you can use to your advantage when it comes to seeing how this series played out. I think that there's something the Phillies can hold on to. Something to use moving forward. The trajectory is going up back to where we need it to go. I'm believing. Call me crazy. But I am believing in this team right now. I was down in the dumps. I was crushed. I said I was losing it a million times. But I thought I saw something. I was intrigued. My eyebrows raised. There were moments in this series where I saw the Phillies of the first month. I saw the Phillies of April. Now can we get it out of this team more often? Let's talk about how this series played out. In game one, this is where the Phillies got obliterated. They lost 16-2. to It was a wake-up call. There's no denying it. When, when I tell you sloppy play, that doesn't even describe what went down. That fourth inning in that baseball game, we forgot how many outs there were. Players were standing around as if there was another out to be played at the end of the inning. JT Romuto was the only one who was sort of ready to rock and roll to get off the field. We, we didn't have people covering first base. There was no communication on a, on a safety squeeze bunt. They ran a double steal. I mean, these are things that, you know, you learn when you're 8, 9, 10 years old. The team wasn't engaged. The team was lost mentally. It was Zach Eflin versus Clayton Kershaw in this game. We had Kershaw with a high pitch count throughout three innings of this baseball game. We had bases juiced twice in the first three innings and could not score at all. The only time we scored was because Scott Kingery had a solo homer, and that wasn't even involved with the bases juiced opportunities. Jay Bruce had chances with both of those moments, and he couldn't knock them in. And once we didn't execute, once we didn't get any runs scored, the, the Dodgers, the scariest team in the MLB, took control, dominated, embarrassed us. Now, this was the game where Mike Alfranco doesn't hustle. It was the third inning. Bases juiced, two outs, he hits a ground ball to the left side, he doesn't hustle, he jogs, he's lackadaisical, he takes his sweet old time. There was an error throw where if he hustled, he would have been safe, but because he took his good old time, they had an opportunity to find the bag and put his foot down, and he was out. You're in a baseball game against the Los Angeles Dodgers, right? That's a game that should fire you up. Because they're fantastic. They're great. They're such a dominant baseball team. Going up against them at home, you should be so dialed in, so focused, so willing to make it happen. You're up in the baseball game. The Phillies have been in a slump for six, seven weeks already. How are you not hustling? Like, it blows my mind. How are you not giving me more effort? Mike Alfranco lives for the moments. He had a walk-off dinger against the Washington Nationals the series before. He's throwing his hands up. He's fired up. He's excited. He's emotional. He's loving it. But when things don't go his way, he pouts. He throws his bat. He's not involved. He doesn't give you effort. Well, that's not how it works, dude. I mean, really, that's just not how it works. So that was a huge moment. And it pisses me off because with Gabe Kapler, and at the moment after Game 1 ended... We, as a fan base, are asking the question, what is Gabe Kapler doing? What is this locker room like? What is the culture? Because we've seen Gene Segura get away with not hustling before. Multiple times. We've seen Mike Franco now do it in this game. Like, what is the deal? How come no one's respecting Gabe Kapler? He always has talks with people. 
while we spoke after the game. Well, that's great, Gabe. Really, that's fantastic. How about you do something? How about you hold people accountable? And he takes that approach. Now, it somewhat bothered me because it's almost as if Mike Franco's not as good as Gene Segura, so that's why he got sad. It was punishment towards that. If it was someone who was talented, Gabe Kapler wouldn't have done it because he respects his, his players and he expects his players to step up once they're told they have to hustle. But clearly that doesn't work. So he put his foot down and Michael Franco was also injured. So it was a mix between injury for game two and Gabe Kapler showing the team, hey, listen, if you're not going to give it to us, you're not going to play. So for game two of this series, Michael Franco actually got punishment. He was held accountable for his actions. And, and good. I mean, I don't like it because if you're going to go with one way, you stick and live and die by your guns on what you think is right. But at the same time, you can't keep allowing these players to not respect you. So you have to stand up for yourself as a manager, and Gabe Kapler decided to do that. But that game one was unbelievable when it comes to domination. Our our bullpen, our starting pitching wasn't good, Zach Eflin, but our bullpen, Ramos, Rios, Garcia. If I got to see Garcia pitch another game, I'm going to vomit. He is so not ready for the majors. He's just not good enough. I can't stand watching him on the mound. He's horrible. And we also had to throw in Roman Quinn. Yes, that's right. You heard me. Roman Quinn got legitimate time on the mound. The, the Dodgers were making a, a joke about us. I mean, they're they're keeping the ball after Roman Quinn strikes someone out. They're keeping the ball to, to give it to Roman Quinn for his, for his, you know, case in his house. Like, hey man, your first career strikeout. They're laughing. That That's literally laughing at us. So in game two, the Phillies respond from that brutal game where they allowed 19 hits, where Cody Bellinger had two home runs, where he had four total hits. The Phillies bounced back in Game 2 with Bryce Harper's most defining moment as a Philly. A walk-off beauty smoke shot to center field. Bryce Harper in this game took over. He was a, a player that stood out as very noticeable, and controlled the game and was a leader. Emotionally and and physically, he was everything we've paid Bryce Harper to be in that moment, in that game, and it was truly outstanding. We had a 6-1 to lead after two innings in this baseball game. And guess what? Shocker, we found a way to blow that. But to take the lead, Scott Kingery hit another homer, so that's two games in a row where Scott Kingery went deep. And I'll tell you what, Scott Kingery has been so exciting. I mean, really, I've loved what I've seen out of Scott Kingery so far. His approach to the plate is tremendous. His power is absurd. I would have never expected Scott Kingery, after watching him last year, to have the power in this season that he does. It's night and day from what we've seen last year with Scott Kingery to where he is now. He's literally crushing the baseball when he gets a piece of it, too. I mean, you're talking almost second-deck dingers. He's providing so much spark and so much power you got to give him credit, man. So Scott Kingery ends up homering in Game 1. He homers in Game 2. Brad Miller's playing for Mike Alfranco. He hits a dinger. He crushed it. It was a hanging curveball by Bueller. This matchup was Vin Velasquez versus Bueller. He hung one, and Brad Miller took it deep to right field. And Bryce Harper murdered a three-run bomb to center field as well. So 6-1 to one lead, and, and slowly Vin Velasquez allowed home runs and allowed home runs and allowed home runs and, oh yeah, hold on, allowed home runs. He only went four and two-thirds, where he strikes out an, an obnoxious amount of people, but gives up a lot of homers and can't go deep. What a way to describe Vin Velasquez. He's got the stuff to strike people out, but he allows deep balls, and he can't go deep in the games. It's absurd. It really is unbelievable. I've never seen anything like it. Oh, wait, yes, I have. Pretty much all of the young guys that are on the Phillies pitching staff still. Whatever. Don't even get me started on Vin Velasquez. Hector Neris comes into the baseball game when the Phillies have a 6-5 to lead in the ninth inning. We have a lead. We have our closer. 
Well, the Dodgers had something to say about it. And this is why they're one of the best teams in the league. And realistically, the best team right now in the league. Because Beatty comes up and rocks a three-run bomb. And now the Phillies are down just like that. Crushing. Crushing. I couldn't believe it. I was devastated. I even put up an, uh, an emotional selfie of myself. And put it up on Twitter. And stated, I'm numb to the pain. I'm numb to the pain. Because I knew it was coming. When when we were sitting there as Phillies fans, keep in mind we lost game one sixteen to two, right? We had a six to one lead in game two, we were pumped, and you see the lead start to fall apart. And as Phillies fans, we all watch that baseball game saying the same thing. It's going to happen. We are going to blow this game. We are not gonna win. We are not going to execute. We are not gonna finish this game out on top with the W. And as soon as that home run happened, I was numb, but I I knew it, man. Like, I knew it. I knew that was going to happen. Enter Andrew Knapp in the bottom of the ninth when the Phillies were down. Andrew Knapp was the reason why this game happened. This comeback happened. Now, Jansen was on the mound, and he got hit by an Adam Hazley ground ball right up the middle, and, and it hit his leg, and he had some time there to, to kind of feel it out, but he continued to stay in the game. But Andrew Knapp hit a double. Scott Kingery stepped up big. Bryce Harper walked it off. He smoked it. I mean, crushed it. Obliterated the baseball. To center field, Pollock couldn't handle it right. Everyone's saying, oh, Pollock, you know, if he could have handled the baseball there, it would have been a totally different outcome. The, the ball was on fire coming off of the bat. He found it, man. Like, Bryce Harper found it right in the middle of the barrel. Did you see how hard that flew to center field on a line drive? It was murdered. It was a hard play to make. Could he have kept it in front of him? Sure, maybe. But, I mean, I don't blame him. It was a rocket launcher. And Bryce Harper was was celebrating with his teammates. The reaction by his teammates was so telling to me. It was so special to see the team so energized, loving each other, loving the moment, embracing the moment. It was fantastic. And it really, truly was the best moment for Bryce Harper's career so far in Philadelphia. We've obviously spent a lot of time watching him play we've spent a lot of money investing in him and that was a spot where he had to come up big he had to make a statement he had to be the guy and he he was he he absolutely was Bryce Harper with runners in scoring position I mean he's hitting over 400 there's something special about this guy when there are men on in scoring position he's knocking in runs left and right left and right left and right when there are people on in front of him. His mindset, his preparation when someone's on base is fantastic. It's elite. It's elite. It's at the top of the game. So the Phillies found the way. Now Hector Neris in that game decided to, after he allowed the three-run bomb to lose the lead in the top of the ninth, he elected to throw at David Freeze. Ugly. Ugly throw. And it ties into something that happens later in this series. He's also appealing a suspension. So he got suspended by the league because it was clearly intentional. You had Clayton Kershaw in the dugout. The the camera was right up to his face. He was freaking out. He was getting all pissed off. As he should. I mean, the Dodgers have the right. That was bad. He did it on purpose. And I think throwing at people, it's acceptable at times. You pimp a home run. Okay. I mean, it's baseball. It is what it is. I mean, that's just the the unwritten rules. You pimp a home run, you bat flip, you do certain things, you trot around slow, you get beamed. And and that's just what it is. That's reality. And okay, I mean, I get it. It's kind of silly. It's childish. But I, I get it. It's been around the game for so long. In this situation, Hector Neris was just so disappointed in himself and so frustrated, he decided, I'm just going to hit this guy. And it was like the back of the neck area, back, it just, it was so unnecessary. And it was so uncalled for. And it was clear as day that he was just really upset with himself that he allowed the homer. 
but you can't just do that. Like, be mad at yourself. Be pissed off with yourself. Let it burn inside and come out and execute another day. But you can't throw at, at the Dodgers because you messed up. You messed up. They didn't do anything wrong. In my opinion, soft move by Hector Neris. The, the very poor choice. And apparently, uh, Hector Neris, now I don't know him personally, but apparently this guy is is A+. Plus. Very well-respected, super nice guy, fantastic guy off the field. So it's almost shocking that he had a moment like that. Once again, I don't know him personally, but this is just what you know. You read up about the guy, that he is very well-respected in that locker room, and he is a tremendous guy in the community and just such a nice person. And he let the emotions get the best of him in that moment because he was disappointed in himself for making a bad pitch. The problem with Hector Neris is if his fa- if his fastball is not there, it hurts. If his splitter is not there, it hurts. Now, that seems silly. Of course that's true. But his reasoning, you know, his, his domination comes because his fastball is being used so much more this year, which opens up two different pitches. Like, before it was just splitter, just splitter, just splitter, just splitter. Where if you're a hitter, you can sit on that splitter and expect the splitter more often than not. And if that splitter wasn't on point, well, now you're really in trouble. But now he's been throwing the fastball way more, and that just opens up a different mindset when the hitter is up there. You have to expect two different pitches now, and it's it's completely different. So when both are on, it's elite Hector Neris. The problem is getting that on all the time. We're hitting the point now where <clears throat> Hector Neris, excuse me, we're getting to the point now where Hector Neris is hitting that point. We've seen this in his career. He had all-star numbers in the beginning of the season. We're hitting late July, middle July. We're hitting August. Is he wearing down? Is he being overused? Is he a legitimate closer? Those are questions that we're going to have to wait and see. We're going to have to have time tell us. But this is pretty much where it normally happens. And that's the concerning part as a Phillies fan. This is where starts to go down. So we got to keep an eye out on Hector Narison and how he performs moving forward with this baseball club. So at this moment, we are 1-1. One and one. We are embarrassed in Game 1. And in Game 2, we probably have the best win of the season. And our superstar that we paid for in the offseason came up so big for us and came up so clutch for us. We're sitting on cloud nine and everyone's saying this was such a big win that we can grab it and use it for momentum. And I was a believer of that until I saw the lineup in game three. This was a throwaway game. This was a throwaway game. Jay Bruce was injured. He got hurt swinging the bat and it looked like an oblique injury. So no Jay Bruce in the lineup. Because of the fact that that game four was an afternoon 12-30 game with Aaron Nola on the mound. JT Romucho was going to catch that game. Well, you have to throw Andrew Knapp in then. So no Jay Bruce, Andrew Knapp. Michael Franco still had the injury issue. So you have Brad Miller in. And to be honest with you, I think they went with a, a, a better uh, matchup analytically there when it comes to Brad Miller. I believe that was the case. Who was on the mound? For that third game. Maeda. I don't know if it was an injury thing for Mike Alfranco. Or or if it was a an analytical approach. But regardless. So no Mike Alfranco. No Jay Bruce. Who else was sitting out? Gene Segura had a lingering issue. The lineup was so bad. It was so horrendous. It was a throwaway game. And I was extremely disappointed. Because we're coming off of one of the best wins of the season. We're coming off of a Bryce Harper domination game. And we respond with a lineup that had zero chance of winning. And I'm thinking, if I'm Gabe Kapler, how do I find a way to make this better? I can't allow this to be what is thrown out there on the field. I just can't allow it. It's unacceptable. But there really was no other way to go. I was trying to convince myself you let JT Romucho play this game and the afternoon game the next day and, and sit him against the Detroit Tigers or something, but but that's not reality. That's not how baseball works. I was trying to force things in my head. How can we make this better? How can we make this different? There really was nothing. So with the lineup, we had Cesar leading off. You know, you got Scott Kingery, Bryce Harper, Reese Hoskins. But from that point on, it was Brad Miller, 
Adam Hazley. We had to bring up Nick Williams, Andrew Knapp, and the pitching spot. So that's the bottom five hitters in the lineup. There was just no depth there. There was nothing scary about this lineup whatsoever. We finished the day with two hits. And one of those was was in the ninth inning where Adam Hazley hit one that didn't mean anything. So realistically, we had one, one hit when it mattered. And we walked 10 batters. The pitching was bad when it came to walks. Now, there was a, a really long, long delay in this game. A long rain delay, which killed momentum. Because it was Nick Pavetta, Paeta, and neither of them really got to go. But with Nick Pavetta, he went two and a third. But he had 50 pitches already. Two and a third, 50 pitches? Come on. And he walked four batters. He got out of the first inning jam with bases juice. He only allowed one run. I don't know how he only allowed one run, but... You know, to, to to have 50 pitches after two innings, it's just not good enough. And the rain delay kind of saved him because that would have destroyed him. He was on pace to go, what, four innings? Come on. It's unacceptable. But in that game, I hate the fact that we went into it knowing the baseball club was not in a good position to win. They were in position to fail. And you got Matt Klentak up there. You got McPhail up there watching this, seeing this. Middleton up there seeing this. So from that aspect, I'm saying, okay, maybe it's good this crap lineup's up there. So this front office can see what is actually on the diamond. What this fan base is witnessing with their eyeballs. Now there was a very unique story about McPhail and and. And Matt Klentak, and we will get to that very shortly. But let's finish game three first. The way the way we approached game three, it just irked me. It's that simple. We fall seven to two. We weren't even close. We weren't even invested, and I know you can you can look at the top of the lineup just as much as the bottom of the lineup because Cesar didn't produce, Bryce Harper didn't produce, Reese Hoskins didn't produce, Scotty had a decent day, he had the one hit, he had a couple walks, but the top of the lineup didn't produce either, but there's value in having a deep lineup in my opinion. The reason why guys thrive at the bottom or the reason why certain guys thrive at the top, it, it all comes down to depth. Because if you start an inning off with the bottom of the lineup, when the bottom of the lineup looks more like Jay Bruce, and I know he was injured at the time, so you can't really use him, but Cesar Hernandez, Michael Franco when they're on, and, and, and the lineup turns over, it's just completely different. But there's no value when it's Andrew Knapp, Nick Williams, and, and Adam Hazley down there at the bottom. It's just not. So for me, going into this game was just so frustrating and I couldn't believe it. The moment the lineup was posted on Twitter, my eyes lit up in disgust. And there's context around it. If this was a random game and and I knew the circumstances, I'd be like, okay, you know what? Like, Jay Bruce is hurt and and JT has to play the next day. I, I understand the circumstances, but... Because of the fact that we're losing so much, because of the fact that we've been struggling and it's been a horrendous six, seven weeks, and because we're coming off of such a high, 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 high win, to throw that lineup out just crushed me, crushed me. And everything that happened, I assumed would have happened before the game even started. Let's dive into this McPhail and Matt Klintak situation. So according to Matt Gelb from The Athletic and his sources, the Phillies have agreed to contract extensions with these two men without going public. And he gives you, in the article from The Athletic, he gives you comparisons to other teams. There are some teams that go public with this stuff. There are other teams where they keep it a little bit more quiet. The more I think about it, originally I said, okay, you know what? There's other teams that do this, whatever. The more I think about it, this is weird. I mean, it's just weird. How are you not telling your fan base you are bringing these guys back? Why is it so off to the side? Why is it so quiet? How come... You are not telling the people who are invested in you. How come you're not telling the people who buy tickets, buy merchandise, buy jerseys, that you're bringing your GM back? 
for more years, ex- extending his contract. If you firmly believe this is the guy, if you are excited about Matt Klintak getting you Bryce Harper, JT Realmuto, Gene Segura, those type of players, if you're truly pumped about what he brought this team so far and you trust that he is the man moving forward, you got to sell that to us. If I'm Matt Klintak and I hear that the, 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 G, the owner doesn't want to tell the fans the GM's coming back, how, how does that make him feel? And it's not about Matt Klintak's feelings. Let's get that straight. But that's telling. That it, 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 it doesn't make much sense. To me, that, that raises a question mark as if something's not right. He's afraid, John Middleton's afraid to admit to the Phillies fan base, to admit to the MLB that he's committed to this man. Like, what's the harm? I understand you can't build a championship team in one offseason. That's why the fans screaming, we're winning a World Series before the season actually kicked off. I thought that was silly. We knew coming into this, the pitching was going to be bad. And everyone's roasting Matt Klintak for for what he did so far when it comes to the pitching. And I understand that there are moments where I think we should have done better with pitching. Dallas Keuchel, Kashner, things of that nature. I would have attacked pitching as well throughout this season after I've seen Vince Velasquez too many times. After I've seen Nick Pavetta too many times. But you can only do so much in the offseason. And what he did this offseason when it comes to attacking The roster and attacking the batters and the everyday players, he did a pretty decent job, right? I mean, you can't deny that. Whether the players are underperforming, some people are upset with JT Realmuto, some people are upset with Bryce Harper so far, which blows my mind when you look at, you know, his package as a whole when it comes to RBIs, walks, runs, his his hitting with runners in scoring position, all that. That's ridiculous, but some people are underwhelmed, but but that's on them. Like, we've seen JT Realmuto throughout his career be better than what he is right now with the Phillies when it comes to hitting, but he's never had the pressure. He's never been in the big-time market. But going back to Matt Klintak, what he did this offseason, he did a great job. He can't complete a full roster in one offseason. That's just not logical. That's not how it works. So the way this is all playing out and the fact that you find out that they're extending their guys without telling us, it just raises concern as if why? As if the upper management, John Middleton, it's as if they don't believe in him or they're afraid to admit to us that they are committed to this man moving forward and I don't know why own it if you're going to go down go down full on investing committing 100% this is almost half ass in it and then I saw a story and, and, and heard conversation about when this all went down I mean you're talking months ago well, if this happened months ago, you're talking about, you know, when when Bryce Harper was getting signed here and close to that time. That's the perfect time to admit it. That's the perfect time to come out with it. A month or so or close to when Bryce Harper signs with us, hey, we extended our GM. Whoa, <laughs> ding, ding, ding. That makes sense then. The fan base would eat it up. The fan base would love it to find out this way. I don't know. Something smells funny about it. And once again, in baseball, there's other teams that do this type of stuff. But from my perspective, and I'm part of the fan base, what's the point? Why? I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. Let's go to game four in the series, because at this point, we are down two to one. Game four was impressive. It reminded me of April, May. Nah, not really May. I I think things got a little ugly there. March, April, Phillies this year. We came back. We fought back. The offense got going late. Players made plays. We come back and we win this baseball game 7-6. It was Aaron Nola versus Stripling. Did Aaron Nola have a great day? No. Both pitchers went five innings, but Aaron Nola allowed a ton of homers. He allowed the ball to fly out of the ballpark. Now, understand, this Dodgers team is lethal. This lineup is absurd. They're scary. 
their depth is insane. I was talking about our depth in Game 3. Oh, man, were they laughing at that? They can hit 1 through 9. I'll even throw 9 in there. So, you know, when Aaron Nola's getting shelled, they're go he's going up against elite talent. But at the same time, Aaron Nola's a number one in an ace. He's got to get the job done. So I didn't like Aaron Nola's performance today. I didn't think it was strong enough. But one thing I liked about this win, and we'll get to the later part, which is the most exciting, of course, but early in the game, the first inning, Scott Kingery had a leadoff double. And we knocked him in. Bryce Harper ended up getting a, a sack fly. But this is something we saw earlier in the year when Andrew McCutcheon was still here. Andrew McCutcheon would get a double. Well, then we'd eventually knock him in. Whether it was Gene Segura, Bryce Harper, Reese Hoskins. We got on the board early. We started off scoring in the first inning. I love that. I feel like we haven't seen that so far in a while. So from that side of it, I, I really enjoyed watching the Phillies execute early in the baseball game. And this was a game where it kind of went back and forth. Like, we were up one nothing, and then Aaron Nola allows back-to-back -back dingers to Beatty and Kiki Hernandez. Now we're down 2-1. Adam Hazley hits his first MLB homer of his career. Now it's tied 2-2. JT Romuto gets a sack fly. Now it's 3-2. Like, it, it was a back-and-forth game, back-and-forth game. In the fifth inning, I'm sorry, in the seventh inning, the Phillies were down 5-3. to three. We executed perfectly. Adam Hazley gets hit with a pitch. Roman Quinn with a great at-bat, he gets walked. Scott Kingery, Bryce Harper, Reese Hoskins. Bang, bang, bang. Four RBIs. Players stepped up. Players made it happen. Players executed. The top dogs. The top of the lineup. The players we look at towards when we need that big play, when we need that big hit. And they were able to do so. And we took the lead. We took the lead 7-5. to five. Hector Neris comes in to close the baseball game, and things got a little interesting at the end. We had two outs, up 7-5. Hector Neris allows a homer at 7-6. For the last out of the game, it was a fly ball to right field. Scott Kingery, Bryce Harper, they're, they're kind of miscommunicating, but we get the job done, we caught the ball. But Hector Neris celebrates as he gets the save, might have said the F-bomb, might have had some hand gestures. The Dodgers are all pissed off about it, screaming at him, getting all fired up, talking to the media after, pissed off with him. Keep in mind, he hit David Freeze with that pitch, what was that, game two? So keep in mind that happened. There was a, a little bit of fight, if you will. A little bit of hatred between the two teams. And right now, from a from a Phillies fan perspective, like I want to see this team fight. I want to see this team have heart. I want to see this team wear, wear their emotion on the sleeve. Good. You know what? Good. The more I think about it, good. Embrace it. Because I need this team to have something. I need this team to have a little bit of sparklet under them. I need them to show emotion. Have it. And things like this help the locker room, help the culture. It helps the team bond. It puts them together, stand up for one another. I need a moment like this. Also in this game, Reese Hoskins at first base, he got stepped on twice with his foot on the bag. Uh, now that I'm thinking about it, it's a little weird, right? I mean, that's not common. Twice? What has Reese Hoskins done? Is that them trying to set the tone? Like, hey, you hit David Freese, we're going to step on you as we run the first base? You could tell Reese was really pissed off. Now, the first one, all right, it, it looked like Max Muncy gave a little, yo, my bad, dude. But the second one, he was pissed. And, and Reese Hoskins wasn't even, like, on the bag to an extreme. To me, it, it looked really almost on purpose at this point because there's some sort of issues going on between the two squads so I, at this point I think it had to have been on purpose and and that pisses me off but once again it's something that this team needs this team needs some sort of juice right now it needs some sort of mojo and if that's what it is then that's what it is so take it for what it is the Phillies 50 and 47 are going up against the Pirates and the Tigers there's some off days involved there Winnable? Very. 
Is it winnable? Very. And we have to execute. We need to take this. And I know it's a split. But you know what? I'll take it as a positive split. It's the best team in baseball. You had a walk-off. A very emotional walk-off. The biggest walk-off you've had so, so far this season. And a great comeback win to end the series. It's almost as if Game 3 was a throwaway game. It's hard to even judge it. Because it was inevitable the loss was going to happen. The lineup was so flawed. So with that being said, after the ass kick in 16-2 loss, we have two really solid wins. And we have to build off that. Now, some news about the deadline. Because the deadline's coming up. I hear a lot of noise right now with the Phillies and some pitching. Miner's a name. Boyd is a name. I'm interested in both. I know some fans aren't big on Miner. He's over the 30 years old age. Right? He's older than 30. But look at our pitching staff. It's abysmal. I can't do Vince Velasquez. I can't do Nick Pavetta. I'm okay with Mike Miner. I'm okay with Boyd. A guy that has some years left on his contract. I believe Mike Miner does as well. He's got this year and next year. Boyd, we can work with that as well. I'm seeing Grenke as a name. A lot of money, maybe not when it comes to giving up much. Maybe it's not about that. So if if management is all about spending money and they just want to give up money and not have to worry about too much prospects, maybe that's a name that we can look after and, and look at. And then you see Mad Bum. I'm, I'm not about the rentals. I'm about the future and now. But I, I've been anti, anti-buy, and more selective buy. I won't say anti-buy because I think in baseball, if you're in the mix, you, you buy. That's just what it is. That's reality. But I, I wouldn't be willing to give up obvious players, boom, things of that nature for a rental. That's not, that's not how it works in my mind because we're obviously not ready to go. We're not ready to make that push. We're not one piece away. If you are one piece away, then you start making those moves. But you buy understanding this could be for the future as well. These are players that can help the next year as well. Those are the type of buys I make. But those are the names I'm hearing right now. And, you know, we say we do good against the Pirates, say we do good against the Tigers, which I almost somewhat demand. This team is going to be put in a position to to make some moves. Now, the outfield scares me right now. With Jay Bruce going down with that oblique, obviously the O'Double thing, McCutcheon going down, what we thought we had depth at, we got nothing. Nick Williams is embarrassing. Roman Quinn... The dude just can't play baseball. You know, he's fast. He had that nice walk today when he pinch hit in that in that ninth inning there. Or in that seventh inning there in the ninth spot of the lineup. But he just can't hit. Like, he can't hit. So, I don't know what we're going to do with the outfield position. <sighs> it's tough. It's, it's a tough spot to be in. It really is a tough spot to be in. Right now, though, I'm a little exhausted. Not going to lie. I had a long day. You know, I, I watched the baseball game. I had work. I watched the baseball game. I, I did my post-game recap video. Uh, went out with some buddies today. Tonight, actually, we went out into Philly. I love going out into Philly. I'll tell you what, I really do. There's something special about this city. There really is. Walking around the streets. We went into a couple bars. Went into the, the Evil Genius Brewery, actually. And then we, we went mini-golfing, right? And, uh... I'm undefeated against the girlfriend in mini golf. I'm not someone who's going to let her win, right? I got to show that that I'm I'm competitive. She's very competitive as well. I got to show my dominance in mini golf. This is bad, and I don't know how we got on this topic, but this is bad. I was up ten strokes on the seventeenth hole. The biggest choke job in mini golf history occurred tonight. And and I'm crushed. I scored. Granted, was having some fun, enjoying the moment, laughing. I scored a 21 on the 17th hole. I lost. Now, she's claiming she won. Technically, she won. But did she really win or did I lose it? Because there's a difference. I lost the game. I don't think she really won it. Now, technically, yes. But I'll tell you what, it's frustrating. And I'm going to be uh, staring at the ceiling. A little disappointed at myself tonight. I don't know how long it's going to take me to fall asleep. Maybe what I'll do 
is think about the Philly series. A 2-2 split with the Dodgers. You got to understand the context behind the wins. From the surface, eh, it's just a split. And it's a split at home. Well, one, this team has been playing such bad baseball. And the best team in baseball comes into your building. And you get destroyed. You respond with the biggest walk-off of the season. I can't describe that enough as the biggest walk-off of the season. The biggest emotional win of the season. And in Game 4, you rally back with the offense. It seems as if the offense is clicking. Now, I've always been on the record stating that I'm not huge, uh, a huge fan of Scott Kingery being in the leadoff spot. I think he's adjusting. It's a different mindset. It's a lot to take on. He, now, he's an aggressive hitter, and I love that. But it's tough to be a very aggressive hitter and a leadoff guy at the same time, especially early in the baseball game because, you know, you're know you trying to get a feel of the pitcher. You're trying to work him a little bit. You're trying to see what he's doing. You're trying to earn a walk. But, you know, when I saw that Game 3 lineup where Cesar let off and he had a tough day and, and things were moved around, I realized what we put out in Game 4 with the lineup that's, that's like realistically the best we can do right now-ish. So that's what we're going to have to rock with. Off the top of my head, I believe it was something similar to... I, I might actually have it on here somewhere. Yes, I do. Okay, good. Scott Kingery, Gene Segura, Bryce Harper, Reese Hoskins, JT Real Muto, Cesar, Franco, Hazley. Like right now with where the Phillies are, that's realistically the best bet. It's the best bet right now. And I don't know how long Jay Bruce is really going to be out for. It looked like that oblique injury was pretty serious. It looked like he grabbed it instantly and knew right off the bat that something wasn't right. And you could see his facial expression that he was hurting. He wasn't feeling good. That's a low blow. I mean, Jay Bruce has been someone who has been big in big moments for us, who has been clutch, who has hit home runs, who have who had big RBI knocks when we needed someone to step up. I don't know where this baseball team would be, and that's something I've said for a while. Now, I don't know where this team would be without him. He came in and stepped into a role. He was supposed to be a guy who came off the bench. As soon as he came to town, Andrew McCutcheon goes down, and you know he stepped into an everyday guy and, and was outstanding. It blows my mind, though, to think where we would be if Andrew McCutcheon was still here. Uh, the, the the type of year he was having, the production he was having, the professional that he is, especially in that leadoff spot, changed the game. It changed the game for this baseball club. It changed the way we approached everything. It's wild. It really is wild. It's such a shame. You know, and to expect him to come back next season... And, and have that sort of production where we didn't even expect it to be like that this year. It's going to be hard, especially coming back from an injury like that at his age. I, I don't want to get into next year yet. I, I'm, I'm embracing this this series split and this last game of the series where we won 7-6. to six. I thought the way we handled business, it was solid. It reminded me of early on baseball this year with this Phillies team. Moving forward, though... You know, the pitching scares me. The pitching truly does scare me. And if we can find a way to grab two starters, does a, does a lot of things change? Yeah, it does. I can't rely on the starting pitching. You know, and, and as dominant as Aaron Nola has been, he has had games like he had in game four this year where the ball has been, been murdered off of him, where he's allowed a lot of home runs, where his... His execution hasn't been there. His location hasn't been there. And that's a little concerning. So. And and lastly, <laughs> Ricky Bo on postgame. <laughs> it's the most entertaining thing in the world. There is nothing better than when NBC Sports Philadelphia tweets a picture out of Ricky Bo's face in disgust and says, Oh, it's going to be that kind of night. It cracks me the hell up. I don't know where I'd be without Ricky Bell on post game live. I'll tell you where I wouldn't. I mean, I just I wouldn't be watching post game live if he's not on there. I don't tune in. You give me Ben Davis. Oh, come on, I don't want that. I don't. I don't want these positive guys. I want it how it is. I want it how it is. I want Ricky Bell freaking the hell out, getting fired up, pissed off, screaming. That's the beauty of it. That's 
That's what's outstanding. He tells it how it is. He's a passionate guy. He doesn't put up with the crap. Hey, maybe if one day Gabe Kapler's fired, maybe we could put Ricky Bowen as manager. <laughs> That's something to think about. With that being said, thank you so much for listening to this podcast. I appreciate it so much. You know, I'm enjoying doing these these podcasts after each series. I don't, I don't know if I'm going to hit every single series ever, but it is something that I find entertaining to to talk about after an entire series wraps up. Even though I do post-game recaps individually, I like to tie it around and, and have a general longer conversation about each game and, and kind of ramble. You know me, I'm, a, I'm an obnoxious, passionate guy about this team, and I can go on forever. I really could. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening to this podcast. Depending on which method you are using to listen. I will see everyone next time.